Hi, today I'm going to talk about cold drawing, tension testing, that is, of thermoplastic materials. I'm going to specifically talk about how you can perform finite element simulations of these thermoplastic materials that undergo necking at large deformations. Some thermoplastics uh, undergo this necking phenomenon, for example, polystyrene typically does it, polycarbonate, which I will focus on today, does it, a low density polyethylene uh, undergoes this deformation, but other thermoplastics do not, like uh, high density polyethylene, for example. So when this happens, you get a localized deformation in the cross section of the specimen that you can see in the photo down here. And the question is really, how can you analyze data like that? And to start answering that question, I will today talk about how the material model that you use influences a finite element simulation of such an experiment and talk a little bit about what aspects of the material model control the necking that occurs in these uh, simulations. So to start, let's talk about the simulation approach that I will talk about. I will use um, sort of the, in, this, the starting point that was developed by Ethan Parson in, in his paper from 2004. This was uh, from the research group that I was in at MIT. So it's a good study. They did some very careful experiments. That's what I like it about this particular study, the, the experimental data that they may have for the polycarbonate material. Here's an image from their paper. This is Macrolon 2608. The figure A here is an undeformed state, and they have a speckle pattern on this to do DIC, digital image correlation of it. You can clearly see the neck formation and the neck propagating through the gauge section. This is really what I want to focus on. How would you simulate this in a finite element program? And here is some experimental data, which is obviously really nice to have when you compare the finite element simulations to the actual behavior in this case. From their paper, they, they also published the load displacement curve. See, there's a rapid drop in the force that's applied in the experiment. And uh, that's a, a very clear sign that the material will undergo necking in this cold drawing type of experiment. And um, that's obviously important and also challenging because then you will have a deformation state, a strain state, a stress state inside the gauge section that will be different from different locations. There will be a front of, of this material that undergoes the transformation from unnecked to a necked state. And that's uh, obviously important to capture because that's what happens in the real experiment. So to simulate this, uh, I need a material model. So what kind of material model will we use? There's so many to choose from, but I will pick a material model that I talked about in one of my other uh, videos uh, that I developed. Um, this is now experimental data from Lexon 1934 from a paper, it's based on experimental data from Mulliken and Boyce from 2008. And they did experimental testing of polycarbonate at very high rates, but also low rates. So I, today I will focus on the low rate experimental data from the Mulligan Boys paper. The figure to the left shows the true stress strain data that was measured by uh, Mulligan and uh, three different strain rates. And the figure to the right shows an approximation of the engineering stress strain that was just generated in M calibration by clicking on plot engineering stress strain. So we can't really do that conversion uh, without having transforming, uh, transverse strain information. So M calibration in this case simply assumed constant volume. It's not 100% right, but it gives us a flavor for what the engineering stress strain curve would look like for this type of polycarbonate. We see clearly a, a sharp drop here in the engineering stress at the yield, and that's an indication that necking likely will occur in this material. So I calibrated this material model. Uh, it's a polyumod TNV model. And um, this dashed lines are the predictions from this model. The accuracy of the model predictions is about 2%. So it's a very accurate representation of the experimental data that we have available. The TNV model is my choice here because it, it has some features that are very useful in a case like this, but specifically, I can specify how fast the stress drops after the yield. I can specify uh, how far it goes down, and I can specify how it sort of turns up in the end. So these are really important features when you have a material that undergoes this type of localized deformation, the strain softening at larger strains. There are very few material models that can actually do that kind of prediction. So I picked this one. Another valuable uh, 
piece for this Matia model is that it can be used in virtually any finite element model as part of the Pauli UMod library, and therefore it works in Abacus, ANSYS, LS Dyna, Comsol, etc. And in my study today, I will use Abacus for the FE solver, but it doesn't really matter. You could have used one of, of the other ones that I mentioned or a few other ones as well. So let's talk a little bit about how would you know approximately when necking would occur and how would you know the, the natural, natural draw ratio in a specimen? Well, if you plot the uh, predictions from a material model in this case, or experimental data if you have it, uh, of true stress versus stretch. So stretch is really directly related to engineering strain. So engineering strain plus one becomes the stretch. You see that if you draw these dashed lines, you can create graphical constructs that indicate approximately where necking will occur and also where the neck stabilizes. And that's the natural draw ratio. So the strain inside the gauge section as it has undergoes on this necking phenomenon and before the two frowns reach the end of the specimen, that's called the natural draw ratio. In this case, it's around 0 0.5, 0 0.7 uh, in strain here. So I did three finite element studies that I want to talk about. The first one is a baseline. So I just plugged all of this in to my finite element simulation. And this is what it would look like in Abacus. I use quadratic C3D20, quadratic elements with a lot of integration points. I'm moving the top upwards a certain distance in 100 seconds. And you can see this, the neck nicely just grows downwards until it hits the end of it and then we also see, of course, that the strain inside the gauge section here stays about the same. That is the natural draw ratio of the material, which is a material property. Just like the yield stress is a material property, the natural draw ratio is also considered a material property. Um, so we can plot just uh, images of this. This is how it evolves during the simulation. And if we plot the force displacement prediction from the finite element simulation, well, force is just the reaction force on the top in this case. It's the blue line. It goes up and it drops a lot. And then it's almost stable until the neck reaches the end of the specimen. And that's a fully propagated. And then we start to see an increase in the force again because we started to pull on the tabs and they need to be uh, deformed as well. So that's how this uh, looks on the simulation side. It's very similar in character to the results from the uh, Parsons paper. He used a slightly different material model than I did and, and, and a different calibration that I did, so it's not surprising that we get slightly different peaks, but otherwise it looks very similar. Um, it's tempting to try to convert the force displacement results from Abacus into some kind of stress strain curve. I mean, that's really hard to do. The stress is easy because it's just uh, the force divided by initial cross-sectional area that gives us the engineering stress. So that's no question there. But the strain is a little tricky because strain is not the same everywhere. I plotted in this graph two different ways of doing this. The first one is um, simply taking the, the applied displacement, dividing it by the length of the whole specimen. And that gives me this purple line and goes this, and it drops very rapidly. The black line is when I take the full displacement, dividing it by the gauge section, assuming that everything outside the gauge section is uh, fixed or rigid, which is not true, obviously. And then we get the black line. So, so these are two approximations that perhaps should bound the response in, in the engineering stress strain. But we can see the purpose of showing this is like, whoa, this looks really different than the, uh, the finite element. Uh, the experimental data look very different than the finite element simulation. So it's a little tricky to convert one to another. And I will have another video talking about that soon. In my second finite element study, I will talk about imperfections. Many times when you simulate these types of problems, People introduce geometric defects. And that's what um, Parsons did in his paper. He moved a few nodes on the right side, for example, a little bit inwards to make the cross-sectional area slightly smaller there, which makes the stress slightly higher. And then thinking is that that should cause the neck to occur in a known location. You can kind of see that here in the simulation. I have a defect in the middle. Yes, indeed, we'll see the, a neck to propagate starting there we see a 45 degree kind of angle which is how this likes to evolve initially and then that, then we see the similar propagation of the the neck region during their finite element simulation so this looks really good very similar to the previous one and if we 
plot these individual images, it looks like this. And interestingly enough, the predicted force versus displacement response for these two FE simulations is very similar. So when we introduced a defect, we were able to make sure that it, the neck region started at a certain location, but it didn't really change the force displacement prediction. So it's a, it's a safe way in this case to, to achieve a certain goal, like making sure that it starts in one location. Besides that, it's not necessary. It doesn't really change the results in any other way. In my last study here, my finite elements case study number three, I changed the material model. I want to see what influence does the material model have on this phenomenon that we're talking about, the necking, the cold drawing. So I'm using the same TMV model, but I changed two of the parameters. I changed the, the, the drop in stress to be more rapid after the yield. So it goes down much quicker, as you can see here. These are the dash lines are predicted. They drop faster than it did before. And then I also increased the C3 parameter in the yo hyperelastic model to be a little higher. So it they, they goes up a little higher in the end. So before we run these simulations, let's think a little bit about what this likely will do. Well, the rapid, more rapid drop here will likely make the reaction force from the simulation to drop quicker than it did before because it's more rapid drop here that's pretty clear but by making this go up more towards the end here we can expect the natural draw ratio to go down as well so that means that the neck will propagate through the gauge section quicker in some sense it will reach the end of the specimen at the lower applied displacement because of, of this change so let's take a look what happens if we want to simulate this. Here's an, uh, a, a video from the abacus. See that I didn't have a defect introduced. We see a neck propagating. We see that inside the gauge section, the strain is smaller than before, exactly like we had expected. And um, here are some images from the simulation itself. And if I compare the first case study with the third one, we see that the peak didn't change because we didn't change that. The, the stable value here didn't change either because we kept that more or less the same. But we do see a faster drop as we expect, and we see that we have a, a lower natural draw ratio in the second, in the third simulation than initially because we made it uh, increase towards the end. So this is how you can investigate these kinds of uh, material behaviors. Finite element tools are really useful to gain insight into what's going on in the physics of these uh, simulations in these experiments and, and like learn a little bit about this. So I, I think this is an interesting simulation from that perspective too. So to summary, uh, when you do attention testing on, on materials that undergo this necking phenomenon, you really should use digital image correlation because you can learn a lot from that. But you should also consider doing these simulations that I just talked about here. You can learn a lot about that too, in terms of what's going on, how the material model influences the results. And when you pick a material model, I do recommend something like the TNV model that I used here, because it allows you to accurately predict the response after yielding. The, the reduction in stress, the, the plateau and the hardening can all be captured using the TNV model. And if you like to introduce geometric imperfections or defects in your finite element model, go for it. It's not always necessary. You can achieve very similar results without it too. And, and as no surprise, the material model itself has a strong influence on what's happening in the material and how the specimen behaves. So that's, that's what I want to focus on in this presentation. Let me know below if you have any questions.